excellent presentation. Teraz je priestor pre vás, môžete vás aktorej otázky postoj. Poprosím vám každého, aby sa predstavil, prípadne povedal, ktorý inštitúcie prichádza, ale preto všetkým svoje meno a otázku, nech sa páči, je to priestor pre vás. Enamored with all that now than I was at one point in my life. 
Let's take these tax rates. You now have a 19% tax rate before you had a 48. 42. 42. Okay, for the income tax. Are you raising more money with a 19 or more with a 42? I don't know, I'm going to have to look, but I'm, I'm willing to bet it's probably 19. In, in the U.S., we had this most recent round of, of tax cuts, uh, the Bush tax cuts, about uh, in effect a little more than three years ago. Cutting the marginal tax rate, sharply cutting in the tax rates on dividends and capital gains. Tax revenue soared. I gave examples of capital gains. You do experiments. You keep bringing the rates down and see what happens to revenues over the long run. But of course, it greatly affects economic growth. And all these people, all the old Keynesians and the static people have a static view of the world, were saying, no, this couldn't, we couldn't possibly get those kind of gains in revenue. And I go back to first John F. Kennedy. He cut the rate sharply, the tax rates in the United States. Revenues went up. Then under Ronald Reagan, he cut tax rates sharply. Revenues went up. Economic growth also soared, was the main reason revenues went up, because you reduced the impediments to work, saving, and investment. Um, I look at the world as a, a grand social science experiment, the whole world. We can look around the world, and why do high growth countries, and you see a lot of countries with low tax rates, it do very well. They provide many goods and services for their, their citizens. I just did an article. In fact, if any of you would like to be on the mailing list of my articles, they're all in English. I apologize. I, I, they're also translated in Spanish. I can be provided to you either in Spanish or English, but not in the slogging. Um, I'll just give you your card afterwards, and I'll put you on the mailing list. Of yours. But I did a comparison between the states of New York and Florida in the U.S. New York has I think in New York City, very high income taxes. These are state and local, about 12 percent. Florida has a zero individual income tax rate. A number of the other states do. Then you look at the provision of services, how good are of the schools and the other types of services. Uh, Florida used to be way behind New York. Now Florida, virtually every measure, is way ahead of New York. And I can do other comparisons. A lot of people have done comparisons among the states in the U.S. We have a lot of tax competition need to have the tax competition in Europe. I am a skeptic about the models because, again, one point in my life, I was into the models and we did it all. We did a rather poor job in forecasting. And if we go over to the other side and look at what people really do, we know that if you look at tax rates, uh, when you bring, James Burling's won a Nobel Prize in English looking at individual income tax rates and showing again that individual income tax rates of 20% over the long run, long periods of time, tend to be counterproductive. Now, tomorrow, if you've heard the, your parliament increased the maximum tax rate to 100%, a lot of you would put your jobs right off, but not all of you would. Some would keep working for a little while, but eventually, all of you would stop the job. You're not going to work. So we know it's somewhere less than 100%. The longer period of time, the lower the rate needs to be. And again, go back and say, look at the empirical examples over time, within countries and localities, and then look at it around the world. And I believe the evidence is overwhelming that low marginal tax rates make you better off. Yes, you cut the tax rate right in the very short run, the deficit goes up. And you have to control the government spending. If you don't do that, everything else is lost. But controlling the growth rate in government spending, even though your deficit goes up in the short run, your growth, after a while, the additional growth will swap that. You've seen it happen in your own country. You've seen it happen in Ireland. We've seen it happen in Estonia. Uh, we can go around the world, all through Southeast Asia, the United States. They've all done well. And um, so I respectfully disagree with you. And I'm a radical tax cutter. I agree with the um, I looked at the evidence around the world. We have Nobel Prize winners on all sides, but 
I may be convinced that Milton Friedman and uh, Frederick Hayek and uh, Bob Mundell, James Buchanan, that whole group of Nolan Chryslers was right. And people like Kendall Berger, who I read his book and I studied it back when I first did international economics, had some things right, but he allowed things wrong. Uh, ja by som trošku zneužil svoju situáciu, ale by som doplnil pár slovami uh, pána Rana. Nie je náhoda, že práve krajiny, ktoré majú najnižšie zdanenie a najvyššiu mieru ekonomickej slobody, tak v tých krajinách ľudia sú najvládši v priemere. Sú to také krajiny ako Luxembursko, tu spomenuté, uh, Irsko, Hongkong, Singapur a ostatné, takže naozaj táto závislosť v dlhodobom horizonte sa potvrdzuje a je skutočný tiež e, počas svojho štúdia ekonomického postupne naozaj prichádza na to, že ekonomia nie je matematika a skôr sa prikláňa princípom, ktoré sú bližšie k človeku ako akýmkoľvek modelom. A ešte jedna moja poznámka, nie je kľúčer podľa mňa len vidieť to cez čísla, dopad na životnú úroveň a na peniaze, ale aj z pohľadu vlastníctva a vlastníckých práv. To znamená, v hlavnej miery dane poberajú ľuďom vlastníctvo a v hlavnú mieru je to ešte akceptovateľné na hlavnú. Takže to je len taká moja hlavná poznámka. Keď sa páči, kto ďalší? Vernon Smith was a Nobel Prize winner in economics in 2002, and he won it for work we call experimental economics. And he does actually experiments among people to try to judge economic outcomes on a broader basis. And he's done some remarkable work over the last 50 years. And uh, he's a friend of the uh, not too long ago, we were chatting one time, and he said to me, I'm quite amazed because when I was a student, a young professor, I barely knew who Hayek was. And it wasn't until I became an older man that I actually sat down and read Hayek. And I found that what I had gotten to through my experimental economics and conclusions I developed, Hayek was able to intuitively get there all on his own without going through the models and the experiments. And he was quite amazed at you know, how you know, the genius of Hayek, who didn't have the computers and all the things that we have today, but got there. And there's a question back here, and I apologize for interrupting the person. Next question. Hovorili ste o problémoch alebo teda nejakých úzkavkách pri zavádzaní eurá v Európskej únii. Nadobil som taký dojem, že asi rozumný riešenie by bolo zrušiť euro. Pripustíme, že chceme zrušiť euro. Niká otázka, či ho nahradíme. Vychádzaný americký dolár, vychádzaný 25 národný dnev, druhá verzia a tretia verzia môže byť nejaký váš návrh. But it's interesting, Bob Bundell, who was one of the founders of Supply Side Economics, was also largely the founder of the Euro. Now, the Euro can work perfectly well as long as you have a highly responsible central bank, as you had. The European Central Bank, I think, has done a very good job. The problem is, you don't have the full labor and capital mobility within Europe that we do in the United States. And that's why you're having these very high unemployment rates in some of the European countries. I mean, if a Slovakian can earn a higher wage in Paris, you should be able to have the freedom to go there and do that. Now, realize that the French have put all kinds of restrictions on you. The Brits have been better about it. The Brits have been growing more rapidly. And see, in the U.S., because you always have regional imbalances, um, we have a totally mobile labor supply. And so where I live in Fairfax County, the unemployment rate 
is 1.6%. Again, I'm going to take that 1.6% means if you can stand up and walk four steps, you've got a job. They're desperate for labor. So the population there has been going very rapidly as people come from other areas of the country which are not as fluent and prosperous. And that's been going for quite a while, basically because we've got a, a better fiscal policy in Virginia, the number of other states, same thing is true in Florida and I list a number of other states. Some states have poor fiscal policy, such as New York, and we've seen the hemorrhage out of New York State. We go to western New York State, and it's very bleak. The towns have died, the old uh, industrial cities have shrunk in population. It looks terrible. You go around again in northern Virginia, the Carolinas, uh, Florida, Georgia, Texas, and they're all booming. And it has to do with these regional economic policies. And getting back to your, your question about the euro, Hayek wrote a great book called uh, The Denationalization of Currency. And it basically what he was advocating, you go back to the old free banking system like the Scots had, and the governments wouldn't actually produce the currency, they would allow it to the private sector to develop currencies, and some would have gold, and others would have commodity baskets, and all types of things would be innovated. And the currencies that work best, you know, he said, well, let's just go for that. Now that's a very, very radical notion. Um, when he wrote the book back in 74, I think, 75, at that point in time, I was watching the New York Mercantile Exchange, one of my jobs to develop new exchange contracts. So I thought, oh, I've read Hayek's book, I was really impressed, and I said, Let's come up with a, a little commodity basket, which we run sort of as an artificial money. And the people who were at the work at that point, I was, I guess I was like 20 or so, they all thought I was totally mad. And of course, not what kind of basket is commonly traded. Um, I think that realistically, you're still going to have government money. And there's great advantages to having a money that has a very large market area. In the real world, we have really only three currencies, the dollar, the euro, and the yen. And virtually the other currency is tied to it. The Chinese currency is basically fixed to the US dollar. And um, this is a bit of a digression, but I find it quite interesting because there's a huge misunderstanding about, even in the United States, maybe these misunderstandings are the greatest, about the Chinese financial system. The Chinese are very good at producing goods. They've got a terrible financial system because they have too many state operating banks and they haven't got the whole thing worked out. So the reason they buy so many US government bonds is because that is the backing for their own, uh, their own banks that provide the, the capital against which their own banks can lend. And until they get that uh, straightened out, they're basically forced on the dollar standard. And that's why they can't really devalue against the dollar, or excuse me, increase the value of, the, of, the, of their Munde, their, their currency against the dollar, because that would make their uh, balance sheets for all their financial institutions worth far less. And so they have a vested interest in not letting the dollar fall that much, because it would end up being a disaster for them. Now, people always Rants and rave, and I see these articles in Financial Times. They go, yes, well, silly articles. I, we see it on the U.S. publications too about all oh, of this horrible trade deficit the U.S. is running. The reason we run a trade deficit is because all the rest of the world wants dollars, and the way they get dollars is by selling goods and services to the U.S. It's a residual effect. Now, if you suddenly decide you don't want dollars anymore, you only want euros or yen, our trade deficit would completely disappear. But it's not something that we overtly manage or can manage. And actually, it's not that big of a deal. You say, well, they say, well, it's running close to maybe a trillion dollars a year now. But we have a 13 and a half trillion dollar economy. Um, it's basically, People say it can't be sustained. Well, it can be. In fact, you can run government deficits. Um, if your economy is growing at 3.5% to 4% of your gross domestic product, 
you can run a deficit provided your debt GDP ratio is more about 40%. Loss in collecting taxes, uh, all the costs of administration, all the costs of avoidance, and all the things people do to legally, illegally avoid taxes, and you know the paperwork and the tax administrators are very efficient and all the paperwork that all of you and businesses have to go through. Capital markets are very efficient. You borrow all capital markets, particularly bigger companies and financial institutions, and it's very expensive. So as long as you're not increasing your debt GDP ratio um, and running a deficit again up about three percent or so, I mean I run these things out basically to infinite, and it makes no difference. Now people say, well, it has an effect on interest rates. If you actually look at the data, only when your debt GDP ratios get much about fifty percent do people put much of an interest rate risk premium involved virtually indetectable at lower rates than that. Now, the Italian example is something to worry about. I think the Belgian looked at The Italians, and I can number, name a number of other countries, once you get over 100%, there's question will ever be paid back. The Italians historically ran a fiscal situation that way, and the way they used to do it before the euro was just occasionally you value the currency, just have a massive inflation, which paid off the bonds in terms of inflation. Right now, the Italians can't do that. So it's going to be very interesting how this all comes out. And um, I hope it comes out benignly, but I'm not sure it will. Human lifespans have increased 
three months for every year. And people said at first that would slow down. The first big improvements were in infant mortality and then getting rid of infection diseases. And now virtually all the increases in the upper end of the scale. I mean, you've got very high, you're actually the lifespans in Europe are a bit higher than that in the US. So what happens? You tend to live to a great age. You don't have any children. Who supports you during all those retirement years? Um, you know, the biggest problem is educated white women, rich, educated white women. They live forever. <laughs> Men die earlier, and if they're poor or minority, you're often, you often die earlier. But rich, educated white women, they go on to the 90s, 100, and they're a huge burden on the system. Um, when I was back on, on President Reagan's and, uh, at Social Security Advisory Council, we were looking at what we call Medicare, our national health system. And people back then were saying, oh, we've got to get people to sm stop smoking in order to, because smokers would cost the system a whole lot of money. But then we got into the data. And back then, the average Amer American male smoker who smoked three packs a day died at 63. It was no cost to our old intention system. So I said, we want to reduce the cost, get everybody to smoke it. But I mean, seriously, we, you have this demographic problem in Europe. We have a less one in the U.S. because we're still growing. Uh, our birth rate in the U.S. is about 1.9 children per woman. You need 2.1. I know in some of the European countries, it's gotten down to about 1.2 children per woman. I think Germany and Italy down there. Italy is actually losing population. We also have a higher rate of immigration than you all do, which supports our pension system. And I'm not sure how you're going to come to grips with this because it's going, it's a huge problem. I mean, you can say rationally you need to go from a uh, defined benefit system to a defined contribution system. And by that I mean most systems now say you reach a particular age, you get so many euros per month. Um, if you go to a defined contribution system, means you get a deductibility for putting money away, and then you can choose your age of retirement and how much income you want by how much you put away and how many years you work. And that's the only way to sustain it in the long run. But that is a terribly painful transition. And we're struggling much with the United States, and our problem is mild compared to what you have here in Europe. And um, I keep looking around to see which European country is gonna come up with the grand solution first, but you've got a, you know, a fiscal time bomb. But getting back to the stability path, which is the other part of your question, the, the, the way the thing was set up made sense. But the trouble is, it's like the rule of law. You came up with a set of rules, and then when a couple of small countries violated them, they had to pay the fines, and they came down very hard. But suddenly, when France and Germany violated them, well, I remember the French said, well, they weren't going to pay the fine. What are you going to do about it? Well, you weren't going to invade France, so um, there was not a whole lot you could do about it. If, if countries decide not to abide by the agreement, it's like any other failure in the rule of law. And I'm not so much for revising the rules because, let's say you come up with a new, new set of looser rules, and then Italy or France or Germany or somebody else decides to violate them. And you Dutch are going to be in the same problems you would have before. Um, I mean, again, if you could have more labor mobility within Europe, that would help a lot. And you've got to work on the pension program. I don't have the panacea here. But I'm sort of sitting on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean watching what you all do, how to get out of this mess. And Hopefully you'll have good lessons for us in the United States so we won't screw it totally up. Thank you, Mike, uh, energy. I would like to ask you a very practical question. You already mentioned about the growth of the economy is for the medium and uh, medium, small and medium enterprises, which is startup, which should be conditioned from the technical model that it should be 
um, but, but it's from the government should give all the conditions to start the conflict. One question is what is in your opinion and now the discussion how to support small and medium enterprises to raise the capital? Because one of the important things is raise the capital. Uh, on the one hand, the capital market usually in the transition economy, except uh, maybe Poland or Hungary, doesn't work too much. And is missing the venture capital. I would like to kind of ask you, what is your opinion from US point of view? Because I understood I was in US in New York. And they mentioned me that it's very important to have really venture capital before the, the company going to be listed on the NASDAQ or the stock exchange or the New York stock exchange. Actually, uh, with having built a few businesses from absent startups and having actually physically gone through the column trying to raise venture capital, it's always difficult. And even though I had a number of wealthy investors and we were well connected, it was not easy for us. It's never easy. Uh, in Europe, though, you have a very well-functioning capital markets, particularly in London. And in the U.S., we're suffering from too much regulation as part of our, um, particularly going public, and we've got our sarbanes oxley bill and a few others. Excessive regulation. So a lot of new initial public offerings are actually moving from New York to London, which is good for the Europeans. I see a lot of competition in the European capital markets uh, with the Germans and the uh, British particularly, the Dutch and the French, and they're all getting into that. Um, I, I don't think the rate of doing the venture capital of medium-sized businesses is any more severe here in Europe, and they actually be better in a lot of places than in the U.S. It's, it depends, on, again, on the country. And so but um, I still think the biggest competitor here in Europe is just the, the, the time and money it takes to launch a new business. And again, if you can sweep away all those regulations, this gentleman wants to go out and start a business tomorrow. I don't care if only has ten dollars in his pocket. But you know, a, a small amount. He should be able to set up any kind of legal business he wants to. Instantaneously. And that will give you your biggest on the capital markets, uh, you've got good competition within Europe. You need to keep the type of tax and regulatory competition you have in Europe. What I worry a lot about is the EU being this big regulatory state itself, a bureaucratic regulatory state, because there's no competition with it. I mean, the French and the Germans and the Brits competing on regulations, that's fine. That keeps the regulatory burden down. When you got the EU up there, you know, trying to micromanage everything, that is very troublesome. We also have the big micromanagement coming out of international organizations like the uh, OECD, the IMF, the World Bank, even the UN. And I think that is very troubling for a long run. A number of these organizations want to have their own source of tax revenue outside of national governments. And I look at that as very dangerous. Uh, Jacques Chirac in France has gotten used to this, you know, this tax they're going to have on airline fares going in and out of France, supposedly for African relief. Um, you can call me a cynic, but I doubt that many of the people down in the African bush are going to see much of that money that is raised from uh, international airline travelers traveling in and out of France. If, uh, if two cents on a dollar ended up actually down there helping people after it goes to the hands of the French and the international aid organizations, I'd be greatly surprised. Any others? Thank you all very much. Uh, one more. I have a question. Uh, the theory said that uh, there, are, there are cycles on the growth and uh, there is the growth and the uh, crisis changing. And if there is a there, the government, if they, they have different focuses on uh, what they should do in the time of crisis and growth, or maybe you think that if, if uh, the government follows all those ten steps, then there is only permanent growth. In theory, we don't need to have business cycles. 
Um, business cycles are almost always caused by mistakes from governments, uh, usually central banks, uh, where they have too restricted money supply. And, well, first they let expand too much, and they have inflation, and then they overreact, and you have restricted monetary growth, and that reduces the amount of capital investments available, and diminishes makes it hard to borrow mortgages for houses and everything else, and all tanks, and then they come back. Um, you can have external events. I mean, you go back 100 years ago, and there is a lot of literature about agricultural cycles, you know, droughts and floods. In the modern world, they have very little impact. Um, even the terrible hurricane we, the hurricanes we had last year in the U.S. It didn't seem to knock off much growth, maybe one half and one percent. And we really got bad with Katrina and a number of the others. Um, in the old days, that would be catastrophic. Um, things happen. I mean, I could say, yes, we could have a world which we, the major states should grow four percent forever, and the um, countries are not as rich, should grow higher than that until they get to the level of rich states. And you can build a theoretical model of how that should happen. But we know things will happen. Wars, volcanoes, you know, things happen. And um, just trying to learn from our mistakes. And we tend to come back quickest when there's the fewest impediments of tax and regulatory impediments to allowing people to take care of themselves. Um, yes, government needs to have, provide a, a basic, um, you know, landing so that people, we don't want people starving, we don't want people without basic medical care when they really need it and so forth. But once those basics are very basic, we need to have a lot more individual self-reliance. And that works. And we see over the globe. When you look at places like, uh, South Korea and Taiwan and Singapore and Hong Kong, all through Southeast Asia, the enormous developments take place in a very short period of time. Think of the professor's comments. Back when I was at Columbia University in, in the 1960s, there were still some people writing back then that countries in tropical latitudes could not grow. You had to be in sort of middle latitudes like the US and Europe. And and there was great skepticism that we didn't have sort of the old Christian, you know, ethic what you could develop. And then Japan took it. And then you saw places like, again, Singapore, which is, I think it's 40 degrees from the equator. And all these sort of myths went out the door. And the thing that's still with us is the impact of, again, rule of law, property rights, tax regulatory policy, and stable money. And I think what you've accomplished in this country is quite remarkable. I know you said things can't be done instantaneously, but I think few people uh, going back 15 years ago would have said Slovakia can make the kind of constructive changes and improvements. It has. And you are part of a living economic miracle. And I congratulate all of you and your countrymen for doing it. Thank you very much.